Alright, so the final couple disorders in sleep. This is very long winded, but it's certainly worth learning about because it affects kind of all psychiatric illness, so you should know about these things and be aware of them. And of course, some of it's testable. REM sleep disorders. So, these disorders include nightmare disorder and REM behavior disorder both of which are testable. The hallmark of nightmare disorder is terrifying dreams whose content is often remembered by the patient. So remember, it's a current, nightmares occur during REM sleep and it's vividly remembered by the patient. On like sleep terrors, the nightmare disorder lacks autonomic arousal. So the patient will have the tachycardia, the tachypnea, the majoriasis frequently, that, and it frequently occurs again later at night because remember REM sleep, REM intervals increase as the night progresses, and it's characterized by muscle atonia, so there's no tone in the muscles. Nightmares are associated with increased emotional stress, so again, reducing stress. Everybody out there should be trying to do their best to reduce their stress because I think that's a big part of dissatisfaction in life. I think that's a big part of why people are having difficulties uh, and a lot of troubles is because they just have too much stress. So treatment of choice, decrease the underlying stress. How about the nightmare disorder DSM-5 criteria? So, repeated occurrences of extended, extremely dysphoric and well-remembered dreams that usually involve efforts to avoid threats to survival, security, and physical integrity, and that generally occur in the second half of a major sleep episode. So, again, occurs in the second half of a major sleep episode because that's when REM occurs, and these are just really terrifying dreams that usually involve some kind of threat to your survival, security, or physical integrity. On awakening from the dream, the person rapidly becomes oriented and alert. The sleep disturbance causes clinically significant distress. It's not associated with any psychological effects of a substance. And coexisting medical and mental disorders do not better or more adequately explain it. REM sleep disorders. So REM movement disorder. This will be the next one. This is, this is interesting because, again, REM sleep, I just said, its muscles are generally atonic. They're not, you're not moving. So let's see. Repeated episodes of arousal during sleep is associated with vocalization and complex motor behavior. So again, that's very different for REM because you shouldn't be moving at all. These behaviors arise during REM sleep and usually occur more than 90 minutes after onset of sleep onset. So again, we said that you know REM generally occurs somewhere between 90 and 100, 100 minutes or so after sleep onset will be your first REM, REM uh, stage. So that's why this happens at that point. Upon waking from these episodes, the individual is awake, alert, and not confused, which is different than the sleep terror or um, sleepwalking, where when the patient's sleepwalking, they're you know they're not easily aroused and they aren't awake, alert when the episode's over, and they're very confused. So you want to have either the following: one, REM sleep without atonia or polysomnographic recording. Two, a history suggestive of REM sleep behavior disorder and an established diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Um, the behavior causes clinically significant distress impairment, obviously. The disturbance is not the effect of a substance. Obviously, you don't want it to be substance induced. You don't want it, it has to cause some kind of clinical, clinically significant distress, and it's not due to any other medical or mental disorder. Um, Key points, so repeated episodes of arousal during sleep associated with vocalization complex motor behaviors. It uh, occurs during the latter half of, the, of sleep. Um, REM usually occurs after 90 minutes, so sometime around then. REM sleep without atonia, so if you want to diagnose it, you want to see REM sleep without atonia on uh, sleep study and a history suggests of a REM sleep behavior disorder and established diagnosis of some other neurological condition. Um, let's see what else here. So this is perhaps the most traumatic of all the sleep disorders. Patients appear to be acting out their dreams, um, the content and content through motor movements that result from a loss of muscle atonia during REM sleep. Again, muscles should be atonic at that point. If they're not, then, you know, this will be detected on sleep study. In contrast to sleepwalking, which occurs during the first one-third of the night during delta sleep, REM movement and behavior disorder occurs in the second half of the night during REM sleep, and patients often remember the content of the dream. So key points, it's the second two-thirds of the night, not the early one-third of sleep. It's occurring during REM, and it, the content of the dreams is remembered vividly by the patient. Although 60% of cases are idiopathic, meaning we have no 
uh, idea why it happens, and up to one third are due to uh, brainstem pathology and alcoholism. So, 33% or so are due to some kind of brainstem pathology and alcoholism. The disorder is more common in the elderly and affects males nine times more frequently than females. So again, think elderly male patient. If you're if you're seeing a question about this, think elderly male patient. How do we treat it? Well, we do low dose clonazepam can be helpful in decreasing REM sleep because we said that the benzodiazepines can decrease the REM sleep density and by and by suppressing the amount of REM sleep. So again, low dose benzos might be the drug of choice if it comes to that. Hopefully it doesn't, but it may. The last one I want to talk about is restless leg syndrome. So restless leg syndrome as defined by DSM-5 is the urge to move the legs. And again, this person is awake at this point usually. They're, they need, they have a, just a sensation that they need to move their legs and it's usually relieved by moving the legs. So, and, um, you know, again, they have this uncomfortable sensation, this urge to move, and it's characterized by the following. The urge to move the legs begins during rest or inactivity. So a person goes to lay down in bed, let's say, and they feel this con this sudden, you know, uncomfortable feeling, uncomfortable urge to move their legs. Two, the urge to move the legs is relieved by movement. So then they have to get up and move the legs, or they have to hang their legs over the side of the bed and move them around a little bit, whatever the case is. Um, and the urge to move the legs is worse in the evening or at night. So this is kind of the criteria that they use. Again, the symptoms for criterion A occur three times per week and have persisted for three months. So everything in sleep is like three times per week and have persisted for three months. So that's kind of like the standard. If you remember, it happens at least three times per week and persists for at least three months, then you're probably going to get the timing right on any DSM-5 question they give you related to uh, sleep disorders. So urge to move the legs, relieved by movement of the legs, and the urge to move is worse when they're trying to relax at night or lay down. So those are kind of the key points. Again, they're not attributed to other medical conditions, not attributed to substances, and it causes significant distress and impairment in the person's life. So restless leg syndrome, how do we treat it? Now, this is kind of interesting, but treatment is really geared towards symptom management and should be considered in patients with complaints of restless leg syndrome. Again, at least three nights per week for the past three months. That's the key timing. Medications used are dopamine agonists. So if anyone asks you, this is a key point, this is a certainly going to be on exams, is what would be the treatment for restless leg syndrome, or you get a vignette where the person lays down in their bed, they have to move their, they feel this sudden severe urge that's uncomfortable to move, and they have to get up out of bed, move around a little bit, and it happens to them more than at least three times per week and for the past three months, you know it's restless leg syndrome, and then they ask you, how do you treat it? Well, you treat it with dopamine agonists. So primapexol, rapinarol, bromocryptine are all effective for up to six months in treating restless leg syndrome. Benzodiazepines such as clonazepam, opiates, anticonvulsants such as gabapentin, pregabalin are effective up to one year in treating restless leg syndrome. Um, presynaptic alpha-2 agonists, so clonidine, iron salt. So iron deficiency anemia, that's another one you want to kind of connect here, is that iron deficiency anemia is associated with restless leg syndrome. Um, so treat the iron deficiency anemia and you may cure the patient of restless leg syndrome. In 2014, U.S. Food and Drug Administration gave commercial clearance to the first device, Relaxis, for improving sleep quality in patients with primarily restless leg syndrome. So the device is a vibrating pad. It delivers vibratory counter stimulation to the patient's legs as the individual lies in bed. So again, if, if the problem is you have an urge to move your legs, if you have a vibrating pad in the bed that moves the legs for you, this would make sense. It would, it would suppress that uncomfortable feeling and that urge and satisfy the, satisfy the problem. Obviously, approval was based on two randomized studies that showed a greater improvement in sleep quality with the device than with a placebo pad. So it's a device that can be used to treat restless leg syndrome. I have not seen that used by anybody yet, but I also don't work in a sleep clinic, so I'm not sure how often this gets used, but it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, again, the primary question you're probably going to be asked is what's the medication of choice? The medication of choice is the dopamine agonist, rapinarol, primifexol, uh, bromocryptine. So remember, dopamine agonists are the most are probably the best choice. The benzos, opiates, uh, anticonvulsants. And the anticonvulsant one is interesting because it's good for treating for up to a year. So gabapentin, pregabalin, which are, are, are very heavily prescribed in both neurology and psychiatry, uh, seem to be good medications as well. So 
those would be my choices. I would probably start with the dopamine agonist if I were making a decision on a patient, unless there were some serious contraindication, and I would probably steer clear of opiates and benzodiazepines. Uh, I would also do a CBC on the patient and, you know, make sure you check their uh, hemoglobin hematocrit, see if they're iron deficient. So that covers all of the sleep disorders, ending off with the REM sleep disorders. Hopefully this was helpful for you guys, and uh, good luck as usual.